Hey, welcome to the Ron Johnson Discipleship Podcast. We're so glad you're watching today to uh, join us as we declare Jesus Christ as Lord of all. And uh, it's kind of fun that we are coming off of an amazing weekend uh, that was really our 245th birthday. Yeah. Uh, we celebrated uh, Independence Day and an, an amazing, I love it. You know, for me, uh, being uh, somebody, a patriot at heart, I can't think of a better combination than having uh, the 4th of July land on Sunday. So, yeah. so we had an incredible uh, day of worship. But prior to that, you, have a, you had a good weekend, good time with the family? Yeah, my parents are in town, so we got to celebrate oh, together. And then we went to see some friends and, you know, barbecue and cookout and just enjoying Lots of uh, fireworks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lots of noise. It seemed like, I, I guess it was because of maybe last year, you know, the plug was pulled with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seemed like everybody and their brother had yeah, fireworks. Ramp it up this year, <laughs> kick it to the next level. I mean, you, you go outside and everywhere you look, uh, there <laughs> they were saved up last year. So <laughs> yeah. They, they the saved year. them all up, and I think they multiplied. Yeah. We were behind somebody at uh, at Costco who was going through the line. They had to get a price check on something, but uh, but he was walking out with like five hundred dollars worth of fireworks, oh, and I thought, man, must be nice. I'm still feeding my kids with five hundred dollars, <laughs> <laughs> not buying fireworks. But I'm glad uh, other people were able. To to do that and it's have time a, to celebrate, yeah. Have a big party, yeah. And then you know, again, I, I thought it was so good because sometimes I think as Americans we we can get so wrapped up in the the celebration, but we forget to give thanks and honor right. the very foundation of our liberties, and that's God Himself. And I think we that was what we endeavored to do on Sunday. Yeah, you know, I was just reading this morning in my in my time of the Lord, I'm reading about uh, the Exodus of the Israelites and yeah. the Passover and just the traditions. The Lord is still when you you must do this, you must not eat bread uh, with yeast and yeah. all the traditions. Why? So you can tell your kids to remember. And I think often we might have forgot uh, the importance of Independence Day. I saw one thing on social media that, that talked about of the signers of the Declaration. Yeah. How many of their houses were burned? How many of their kids and wives yeah. were killed? How how many of them were killed themselves? Yeah. You know, that wasn't a, a fireworks moment when they signed the Declaration of Independence. That was a that was a solemn moment in which they pledged oh their Lord. lives and their fortune, their homes, their families uh, to this yeah, great it, cause. It cost so. them everything. And it's good for us to remember, again, with all the poison going on in our culture today, attacking America as a, a racist nation or as a nation of oppressors and blah, blah, blah. Um, it's nonsense when you look at, at our founders and the incredible price that they paid for liberty, the blood yeah. that was shed, fortunes that were lost. Uh, and really they signed, as you mentioned, when they signed that declaration, it, it was their death warrant. Yeah. Uh, and one of, the, one of the founders said at that moment, uh, we'll either uh, hang together or hang separately. <laughs> yeah. uh, so they really came together. And, and, and you brought out a great point, and we touched on it Sunday, um, that, that many of our founders believe there was a direct parallel between the, the children of Israel being delivered yeah. by the mighty hand of God out from under the oppressive you know, grip of Pharaoh. Uh, and our own nation being delivered out of the oppressive grip of, of, uh, of Britain. And, uh, and that's why many of them were thinking about using that as the seal of America, you know, yeah. Moses and deliver, delivering the children of Israel because there was such parallel. And it was, both of them were miraculous. Um, and, and so we pause, you know, as John Adams challenged us, we pause on that day to reflect and to, uh, have acts of devotion toward God Almighty is what he instructed so that we would remember that America is a miracle. And we talked on a Sunday, you know, we're, we're by far a perfect nation, but we have been a leading nation yeah. in securing the liberties and rights, you know, a, a nation where all men are created equal, a concept that came from from God Almighty and came from uh, being created in the image and likeness of God, came from the scriptures. I mean, yeah. our, our, our founding documents are full of principles principles that were directly extracted from the Bible. And so we pause to give God thanks and to realize that he is the source of our liberty and the ongoing source of the blessings in our nation. And so yeah, praise the true. Lord. It was I, mean, good, I love that point you shared yesterday. Um, well, on Sunday, Sunday, worship is that, um, yeah, we're not perfect. You know, we're, we're learning, we're becoming more perfect nations. And we weren't perfect back, th back then signing the Declaration, but declaring that all men are created evil, uh, equal, not evil, equal. Um, <laughs> evil as well. <laughs> evil as well. But, Before Jesus. <laughs> yeah. um, but the seed of, yeah. of equality was sown that time. I and mean, it wasn't perfect. You gotta, we got to go through the, you know, the women, women uh, voting rights and the civil rights. But still, 
the seed of that that idea that we're all created equal was sown in that document, and yeah. we need to celebrate that. And he said it was self evident, right, that yeah. all men are created equal. It was only self evident to people who are biblically immersed and come right. from a Christian worldview because that concept was nowhere to be found on planet Earth. Right. You know, there, there was always classes of people, yeah. elites and royalty, and, and royalty, and the, and, and the yeah. serfs, and everybody yeah. else. So, right. so we lived in a world full of classes of people right. and inequality, and that idea of equality yeah. was radical. Right. And and we right. need to pause to celebrate that right. and not take it for granted. And uh, that's what in our generation we'll look back with picking a lot of these guys are terrible, blah 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 blah, not realizing the context of it, the world at yeah. the time this was revolutionary and we should celebrate the seed of that instead of trashing it amen so, yeah. so that's what we endeavor to do so celebrate america and yet also point out some of the uh, uh grave threats to our our liberties and our our rights of conscience which we'll get into a little bit of that uh in the program today but just want to encourage people keep your eye out for the the equality act which is a a hideous piece of legislation. There's nothing equal about any of it. Yeah. it. It opens the door to incredible trampling of our religious liberties. It's already fully passed the House, uh, and now it's going to the Senate. Uh, I'm not sure when that's scheduled for uh, for a vote. Uh, Joe Biden, our president, has already said he's going to support it and and pass it, and, uh, and we need to make sure it never gets to his desk, and so please keep an eye out for that uh, as it uh, moves forward. Maybe we'll be able to do a podcast uh, on that in uh, in weeks to come. So, but anyway, let's talk about uh, where we picked up last time. We're wrapping up our our series that we've been doing on uh, five cultural barriers to Christian leadership and engagement in our culture. Uh, and today we deal with number five. But we want to do a qu- a quick recap for you. And as we say these different barriers, I hope you'll be able to think along with us, kind of by, uh, by way of review, uh, that you, that you'll be talking with us uh, uh, as you listen to this podcast and be able to summarize some of these points with us. So let's go. Go to the first one. Yeah, we're talking about spiritual pacifism, uh, the idea that we're one big love bowl. And I mentioned this over and over again. Our top priority is to make sure no one's feelings are hurt. You know, and that's that's what Christianity is. Right, that's the kumbaya the cultural yeah. group hug and not realizing that what's at stake is planet Earth. People's lives and souls are are being contested right now. Yeah. Uh, and the devil doesn't play fair. And so uh, that we're in for a fight. We're not fighting people, but we're fighting bad ideas and yeah, ideologies. Absolutely. And, and again, we're not trying to go out of the way to hurt people's feelings, but we know that the gospel caused division. Yeah, will absolutely. So Jesus said that. Yeah. So the church cannot have a, a love boat orientation. We need to realize we're in a war, and um, and that's why the Bible speaks so much about putting on the armor and those types of things. So yeah. make sure you're you're going to a church that's not naively withdrawing from culture and just pretending like the role of the church is just to to give uh, you know corporate group hugs to the culture because uh, that kind of a church will not be engaged and will not be effective. Yeah. All right, second one was gospel minimalism. Yeah, and we minimize the gospel simply to the gospel of salvation, just getting people to go to heaven, that's it, and not the gospel of the kingdom. And the kingdom is much more comprehensive. Absolutely, it involves every arena of life, government, education, entertainment. And a, and a church know. that's involved in the full gospel, yeah. uh, the marketplace gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, will be a church that threatens the devil because it basically says, hey, all these other arenas are still under the lordship of Jesus and we need to be engaged. And that, that type of a church will actually encourage people in their marketplace, whether it's in government and business, education, law, medicine, whatever the arena is, uh, we're going to be encouraging you to get involved and be thought leaders in those different arenas. Absolutely. Third one was uh, a mouthful: eschatological escapism. What is that? <laughs> what is that all about? It's really talking about our your view of the end times. You know, yeah. and escapism basically is saying you know the world is getting darker and darker. So we as as a church just need to retreat, hide in our bunker, and just you know make sure we got enough of our stores food and yeah. wait for the end to come. Fatalistic, right? Yeah. Hey, what what we do is not going to matter. It doesn't matter in. anyway. Yeah. Um, so let's just stay in our church and do Bible studies. And right. there are a lot of churches, again, they don't touch things like abortion. They don't touch the marriage debate. They don't touch religious liberty. They will not mention anything going on in our large arena because they have a minimalistic view of the gospel, which just says, let's just preach Jesus and get Jesus in people's hearts. But they don't let Jesus out of the cage, the cultural cage, into the community. Yeah. Uh, which leads to the next one, uh, Christian compartmentalism. Yeah, it's what we talked about last week. Is really that divide between the sacred and the secular. It's this this contrived division, you know, people accentuate the whole um, separation of church and state and misunderstanding the original meaning. And but thinking, like you said, it's a contrived, yeah. fake 
culturally created uh, division because what it says is that somehow we can put Jesus in a box yeah. or in a compartment, and Jesus is bigger. He, he resists all compartments. Sure. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And so there there is no compartment that contains who he is, his authority, what he has to say about things. And, uh, and that really leads us to our fifth uh, barrier here, mm-hmm. uh, which is scriptural relativism. Scriptural relativism. If we go back to the compartmentalization, because these things all overlap, you know, the compartmentalization says that Jesus belongs over here and he has authority in the church, but he doesn't have authority, let's just say, in government. Mm -hmm. Or he doesn't have authority in the larger culture, just in church culture. And that's where we get into this whole idea of scriptural relativism. We're living in a culture today that's dealing with a crisis of authority. What What we basically are saying when we talk about authority is who says, you know, who has the authority to speak definitively over a certain issue. And of course, our culture is awash in moral relativism and relativism says, you know, what's true for you, Andrew, might not be true for me. And who am I to impose my views on anybody? And we live in this whole world of where, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a crisis of authority. It's like nobody can say anything objectively or definitively about the rest of us. In fact, it's a big sin in our culture today to do that. Yeah. We live in a culture that celebrates choice. And this is the, the paradox of the blessing of God. And we've talked about this in other arenas. But America is so blessed. You know, you go to Walmart or you go to a grocery store and you don't have one choice for soap. You have an overwhelming option. You have whole whole aisles full of just products to use on our hair, products to wash our bodies with, different soap choices, different fragrances. I mean, you go to many countries and they have one choice or two choices. You go to America and because of our blessing, we have so many options and that's just in the supermarket. But now we, we take that and we apply it to the options of worldviews, of ideas. And you realize that uh, in America today, we've made an idol mm. out of simply choosing. Like I am the sovereign chooser of my life, of everything that involves Ron Johnson. I am sovereign. And and don't you dare infringe on the options that I have or the choice that I want to make for me personally. Right. And that, that I think, describes pretty much where... And that idea of choice has become like a sacred word. And that really com- comes out of the postmodernism. For those who aren't familiar with postmodern, I'm not going to go into yeah. all that. Yeah. But the idea is, is if everything's meaningless, the only thing that has meaning is when I give when I choose it. Right. It's your, weird... choice, your choice itself makes something meaningful, meaningful, or meaningful. because there's no God and, and there's right. no, there's just mess. So choice becomes a sacred thing. And most people don't think like that, but the, the flow of postmodernism flows into that. The philosophers of the age are really contrived this idea. And then but it, well, it elevates choice to this number one thing. And, and what's ironic is, you know, when you re- reject God and you're, yeah. you live as an atheist, then you also jettison any source of meaning. There is no ultimate meaning. And so, like you said, now we begin, now we create meaning out of nothing. You're, you're the creator. Right. Whatever you think is valuable all of a sudden magically becomes valuable. And so we, we've made an idol out of choice, even to the place where, place where we say, you know, being pro-choice yeah. is good. But, but we don't ask this question, like, choice of what? Right. You know, what are you choosing to do? And now we've gotten to a place yeah. where even the taking of an innocent life in a mother's womb is considered noble simply if you choose it. Um, it's interesting because we we go back, to, we harken back to the days of Adam and Eve, the knowledge of good and evil to become like God, right? Mm-hmm. We evaluate not based on the quality of your choice, but whether you get to choose or not. Yeah. Yeah. It's a completely different way of thinking. It's like, it doesn't matter if choice is good or bad. As long as you have a choice, then then you're divine. And that you know? was, you know, and that was the temptation of Adam and Eve. Yeah. And it's the same, as you said, it's the same thing we're dealing with today. We have, we have, uh, you know, taking the apple and yeah. bit it and eat it, uh, eating of it ourselves because we actually think we're God and we get to make the choices. And actually, w- the fact that I make a choice determines that it's good, irregardless of the content of the choice. Yeah. And this this spills over into the church because we're dealing with what what we have referred to uh, in other sessions as a build a bear Christianity model in the church. Mm-hmm. 
Have you ever taken your kids to build a bear? I have not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have. I had some some girls growing up, and not that you know boys don't like teddy bears as well. But I took my my girls there. They wanted to go to build a bear, and the the crazy thing about build a bear is literally you get to build the bear. Yeah. And 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 again, it's all about choice. It's all about options, and and that's that can be a good thing when it comes to building bears. But when it comes to building the church, um, a build a bear mentality, meaning we get to pick and choose whatever's culturally acceptable and we actually let the culture kind of dictate what we touch on and what we don't touch on even in church in other words there are some topics that many pastors just completely stay away from even though the bible's clear and paul was clear that we need to preach the whole counsel of god well the whole counsel of god includes sometimes some topics that are very out of uh uh, you know out of popularity out of mainstream acceptance and when we touch on those things we get severe pushback. Uh, But nevertheless, we're called to be true to the Lord and true to his word, uh, and we're called to preach the whole gospel. And so we're seeing a lot of churches today that are falling prey to to, uh, uh, liberal revisionism. In other words, especially in the area of sexual ethics, we're seeing a caving of the church to where uh, in the area of homosexuality, uh, lesbianism, a lot of the LGBTQ issues uh, the church has really t- taken a, a, a softening approach and almost staying away from the clear teaching of Scripture. And as we've highlighted historically, when churches cave on truth and when they are guilty of scriptural relativism, of, of making the Scriptures fit and shape, shape to the culture, uh, you're really s- signing a death sentence on your church because it's only a matter of time before the people go, well, this church isn't any different than what's happening in the larger culture. Yeah. Why do I bother going to church? Why do I Why do I bother even being a part uh, of a local church? Because you're no different than the culture. In fact, right. you're just like the culture. So whether it's uh, critical race theory or whether it's a lot of the Marxist ideology that's driving uh, racism in our culture today, we see the church becoming woke, becoming part of the times, and in doing so, really selling their birthright um, for the gospel. You know, so we have a kind of whatever a- approach when it relates to all things spiritual. Yeah, and I don't think people really understand that the gospel of the kingdom. Is, this goes back to uh, um, what well, was a minimalistic gospel. The gospel of kingdom is countercultural. It's almost countercultural in every single arena has ever been because it's it's counter human nature. The yeah. gospel of the kingdom, absolutely. You know, I. I even when Jesus preached it, it was unpopular in his culture, you know, and wherever the true kingdom gospel is preached is always countercultural because at the end of the day, it's saying it's not about you. It's about yeah, something. It's go. about the king. There you it's go. about it's not about your choice. It's not about you. It's about dying to yourself. It's it's an issue of authority, isn't authority, it? Authority, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. when you're when you're a citizen of a kingdom, uh, the king has control. The, what the king says is the law of the land. In fact, isn't this what we find when we encounter the scriptures? You know, there, there's a phrase over and over again the prophets used to use, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. It was like a uh, a courier coming into a community, say into Crown Point back in the day when there were kings and kingdoms, and he would say, here, here thus saith the king, here's the edict, and he would read the edict. And what, what that courier said when he said, thus saith the king, uh, that w- that was the law, and it was the job of citizens to listen and to hear the, de- the decree and to obey. Well, when the prophets declare over and over again, I believe it's like a hundred times in throughout the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. I mean, what what's the, what's happening there is that the king is speaking, and the king has the highest authority, and it's our job to listen and to figure out how we can quickly obey what the king is saying. Yeah. And, uh, and so the real rub is, is authority, isn't it, as it yeah, relates absolutely. to our culture today? I, I think it's just counterculture to human nature. So <laughs> we don't understand how basically we're going upstream when we preach the gospel of the kingdom. I don't think we, we're going to get it because when we hit resistance, we're going to adjust and manipulate and change the message. Not realizing that's the nature of the message. It's, it's always going upstream. It's that's right. A human nature. It is. And there's something inside fallen human nature that, that when God says such and such is the way, yeah. obey, that, that we want to rebel. We're Absolutely. like rebellious children. And, and, and our concern here today is that we're talking about barriers to cultural engagement. If your church has kind of a scriptural relativism where the Bible, where you pick and choose and where you're not clear about what you believe and you don't speak with authority. You know, it, it, when Jesus taught, uh, one of the things that the people were surprised about is they say, wow, 
he doesn't speak like the scribes and Pharisees. He, <laughs> yeah. he speaks with authority. 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 There, there was a weightiness about the word of God. And my concern is that the pulpits today are losing the weightiness that comes, you know, the word glory refers to the weightiness, the heaviness of God's greatness. When we speak the word of the Lord, there should be a sense of divine authority that accompanies the preaching of the gospel. Yeah. And what I hear uh, from many folks that end up at, at Living Stones anyway is they say, you know, it's it's great to, to hear the Bible preach because we're preaching a lot of self-help, psychology, psychobabble messages. Mm -hmm. And not that there's not some value in some of that, but when that's your steady diet, you know, people lose the sense of weightiness that comes from the Bible or a sense of conviction. I heard somebody say at one time, man, it's, it's great to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Well, who would ever think that conviction was a good thing? Well, it's a good thing if you've been eating cotton candy all your life and you've been on a love boat, yeah. church, and all of a sudden you realize, hey, wait a minute. God is holy and his word is true. And, and there should be a sense of, of, of conviction about the word of God. And many times that's lost when we, when we preach a relativistic uh, seeker sensitive, you know, uh, make you feel good message constantly. Yeah. Um, anyway, something gets lost in the mix there. Sure. So let's talk a little bit about true Christianity, not this relativistic Christianity. You know, when I say Christianity is a re revealed religion, mm -hmm. what do we mean by that? A revealed yeah. religion. Yeah, we actually have a book in the Bible called Revelations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. But, but which means literally revelation means to remove the veil. In other words, when God speaks, yeah. he is revealing truth. It's not truth that we know by, by yeah. nature. It's, it's not like I dug and discover right. through experimental means. It's it's God yeah. initiating that revelation. I came to this truth on yeah. my own. No, right. no, it's God like, saying this no. is the way things are. Right. And so Christianity is a a, a revealed religion, it comes to us as obje objective truth. In other words, God is the standard for truth, and what God says is true. And so the job of the church in every arena of life is to declare what God says is true. And of course, we, we talk about that. There's consequences that come. There's going to be pushback. There's going to be, you're going to be an unpopular church. You're going to be a church that, you know, oh, that's mean to say what God says is true. And, and what we tried to establish even on Sunday is, when we say, thus saith the Lord, that leads to maximum life. It leads to blessing. It leads to prosperity. It leads to flourishing. In fact, you know, when, when we talk about so many of the problems going on in our nation today, I keep going back to the fact that if we have a culture problem, what I mean by that is we're not living out the kingdom culture. We're living according to the culture of this group or that group. But if you live according to the kingdom culture, in other words, what our king says is true, yeah. you experience life to the fullest. And, uh, and so our job is to stand for the truth. Uh, and I love this question here. We all have to face this ultimate and final question, and I think this is the question you and I need to be confronted with today. Do we accept the Bible as the Word of God, the very inspiration, God-breathed, spoken Word of God, as the sole authority in all matters of faith and practice, or do we not? Is the whole of my thinking governed by Scripture, or do I come with my reason? and pick and choose out of the scripture and actually sit in judgment of the scripture, uh, putting myself and putting modern knowledge forward as the ultimate standard and authority. Now, this, this is being attacked all, on all different fronts, but I think one area in particular I've seen uh, the modern church cave is when we talk about things like heaven and hell. Mm. Nobody has a problem believing that when you die, you're gonna go to a better place. What modern Christians have a problem with, just one of many areas, is that hell makes us uncomfortable. We feel like, how could a loving, kind God be justified in, 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 in having a place called hell, which seems so mean and terrible and unkind? Yeah. Um, but again, it reflects on our part a lack of understanding of the holiness of God and the justice of God. And so many churches are very soft on on hell because it just seems unpopular, or they're soft on sexual ethics, or they're soft on the true authority of Scripture being the final authority in our lives because these are areas that create rubs in society today, um, and they make it seem like God's less kind or less nice than we want him to be. Yeah. Uh, and yet, these are the very areas where the Lord puts the plumb line down and says, hey, are you going to obey what I have to say? Are you going to be 
faithful to, to the word of God? Are you going to be faithful and true? God is a God of truth, and what he says is true. And so the call for us, and I guess the final volley here uh, for our podcast is, you know, will the church be faithful? Will we be faithful to what God's word says? Will we be true, you know, to what he has declared? Um, will we be submitted to it? You know, Os Guinness has a great quote here. He says, truth always matters supremely because God is a God of truth. He is the true one. He acts truly. He speaks truly. And his truth must always be our supreme criterion for uh, and concern, rather. So um, these are some good issues that we have to deal with today. Knowing the truth and then bringing our lives in relationship with the truth. And then as it relates to the church, being the plumb line that speaks truth to culture. Yeah, I think there's a big difference. You, you talk even the word truth today is controversial, which is interesting because truth used to be a good thing and, right. and a non-controversial thing, you know, with the capital T, because there's so many little truth with the lowercase t's around. Like, your truth, that's your truth. That's not my truth. And the scripture basically defies all of that. It says, no, there is the truth and everyone else needs to align. Yeah. I mean, when, the, when, you, when you look, for instance, at the issue of, of homosexuality, the Bible certainly does not forbid healthy friendships. You and I have a healthy friendship. Um, I love you. You love me. We, we enjoy life together. We do a lot of things together. What the Bible says is unacceptable is for a man to have a sexual relationship with another man, period. Now, what happens today is we get in, well, these are my feelings, or I've always, I've all, this is who I think I am, um, and, and all of that issue. And so we take, we take someone's personal subjective feelings and experience, or we have someone that says, you know, I, I'm, I'm created biologically as a male, but I feel like on the inside I'm really a woman. So what do you do with all those kinds of things? Well, you still have the plumb line of truth. God says, look, uh, you can care about someone from the opposite sex, but you cannot have sexual relationships, or you or you cannot have sexual relationships outside of marriage. Well, that's a major line in the sand that our yeah. culture today just says. We trampled that line a long yeah, years yeah, yeah, ago, yeah. decades yeah. ago. We, we crossed those lines a long time ago. So now we're crossing new lines. But but as I tried to share Sunday, when you bring it all the way back, I mean, to something as simple as don't have sex outside of the marriage covenant. I mean, we threw that away, uh, you know, decades and decades ago. And now we wonder why we're dealing with new lines that are being crossed. Yeah. The issue is, will you submit your life to the authority of God's word? And will the church continue to preach these things? Yeah. You know, in Europe and in other places, Canada, other places where uh, some of these uh, hate crime laws and things are put into place, it is illegal simply to preach the word of God. So the question becomes, will we continue to preach and be faithful and true to the scriptures or will we cave in and become a culturally acceptable church yeah. at that moment. And you brought the, the freedom of choice versus the freedom of conscience. I thought it was really good. I want to yeah. explain that a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you would think in a culture that embraces choice yeah. that if someone says, you know, I just cannot violate my conscience. Like now we're dealing with all these um, uh, vaccination mandates. Yeah. You must get the shot. Well, you know, in my conscience, I don't feel like that's the right thing for me to do, somebody might say. Right. So instead of celebrating that choice, because, right, we celebrate choice on everything else, right, right. why wouldn't you celebrate that choice? And what's the difference? I'll ask you, you know, what's the difference between celebrating choice, which America loves, and not celebrating the freedom to make a conscientious objection or to choose to follow my conscience? What's the difference? It's a huge difference. Subtle difference, but huge difference. It, it doesn't make sense. Right, and and this is what the subtlety of choice versus conscience, because choice is still you make it. So you're celebrating that you are your own God, okay. that you're making those choice. But conscience is saying you're you you are under duty of a higher power ah. of something that's outside of yourself, and that's something that yeah. people don't think about as much. Well said, and yeah. and we touched on on this on Sunday. We yeah. said conscience was that part of us that's made in the image and likeness of God. Yeah. It reminds us that the moral law of God is written on our hearts yep. and that our conscience bears witness to that truth. That truth comes from God. It comes from a higher authority. And the purpose of conscience means that we align our conscience with a higher authority. It means I'm duty-bound, as you pointed yep. out. I'm duty-bound to choose to honor my conscience above whatever everybody else is saying. That's why people that stand for conscience are attacked 
in a culture that celebrates choice because as you pointed out, choice is only celebrated when it comes from autonomous, self-guided, I'm my own God, I'm the, I'm the arbiter of all choices, I'm the, I'm the sovereign chooser. As long as I'm the sovereign chooser, our culture celebrates it. Mm-hmm. Right. But when I submit my conscience to a higher authority, then I'm attacked and I'm right. vilified right. in the culture today. Now, if you think about that, it doesn't make sense for own face value. But if you think deeply, it does make sense because in our, in our culture here, which we celebrate, it's basically an idolatrous culture. Of course, you'll celebrate when you said, "I am, a, I am a god." I'm basically, I mean, you're not saying that, but you're acting that way. Yeah. That's celebrated. Yes. But when you say, "I am submitted under authority, my loyalty, and my du- I'm duty bound to to my conscience, which has been placed in here by God," all of a sudden you're being attacked. And that, so, and it, yeah, because now even the acknowledgement that there is an authority yeah. is threatening to people it's in our culture today. And so it's no wonder that many of the younger generation are kind of bristling at at church, and we hear, you know, church is being too harsh, or church is, we shouldn't be involved yeah. in culture, yeah, yeah, we're being mean. All of these things are twisted. It's like when a dad spanks his child for running out into the street the third time um, and when not listening. It's, it's not because the t- dad's being harsh. It's because the dad's saying, I love you enough. I'm trying to keep you from getting killed. Uh, it's crazy how we twist again and we relativize even the meaning of love or kindness, or we see the phrase, love is love. We, yeah. we, we define love in our own image, in our own likeness, well, and, and we get in trouble. And on that note, like, redefining love, even, even redefining choice. Like, freedom of choice, if you think about that, with no real definition, no real plumb line, if the Constitution is you can interpret whatever way you want, the Scripture no is personal responsibility. About, no personal responsibility, the freedom of choice becomes a very, very toxic thing because inevitably, freedom of choice with different people is going to conflict. It will conflict. And again, it goes back to the point which without any boundaries and plumb line, the freedom of choice becomes a vehicle for those who are in power, those who control the voices with the money, with the social media, uh, with the power, with the ability to fire you. That becomes a big stick that they used to beat on other people. It's no longer about freedom of choice. It's about freedom of power. Yeah. And, and and they might even demonize freedom of power, but they're exercising their freedom of power, but they call it freedom of choice. And we got to call people out for that. It's like, this is not about freedom. This well, is yeah. about yeah. biggest club. Who has the biggest club, you sure. know? It becomes a, a sword uh, that's used to punish, again, anybody that, that has a dissenting viewpoint. Yeah. And so, you know, we go back. I love Francis Schaeffer's uh, famous quote. Of course, Francis Schaeffer, this is in the great evangelical disaster that was written years ago. Uh, a prophetic work because I think Francis Schaeffer saw what would happen, just like you said, when when you kind of look down the road and, and, and follow the outgrowth of ideas. You know, bad ideas always lead to bad endings. Yeah. Good ideas always promote blessing and righteousness. And so you got to carry those ideas out to their logical conclusion and see where they lead. But this is uh, Schaefer's famous quote. He said, here is the great evangelical disaster in a nutshell. It was the failure of the evangelical world to stand for truth as truth. He said there's only one word for this, namely accommodation. The evangelical church has accommodated to the world spirit of the age. That's where we get this whole phrase, woke church today. That's what Schaefer was talking about. Instead of declaring the truth as unchanging, uh, that's true for every generation, true for men, true for women, true for every every generation of age represented. Uh, God's word is true. It's the ultimate standard. Instead of declaring truth as truth, we've accommodated to the spirit of the age. Amen. And we're allowing the church to look more and more like the world instead of calling the world to look more and more like Jesus and to look more and more like true. And so if, you know, this is a huge barrier to accommodation because you simply won't get involved in some of these battles today because you have allowed your gospel and your doctrine to be shaped by the spirit of the age instead of by the spirit of truth. Uh, And this is a challenge, it's a challenge we all have to face. Every generation is gonna face this challenge. Uh, but I believe this, our, the call from the heart of God is to be faithful, to be found faithful. Sometimes it's not popular. So when you live for Christ, when you speak up on these things, you know, when you go against the, the current um, of culture uh, and you're countercultural, as Pastor Andrew shared earlier, it's never popular. It's not easy. Uh, it's always a challenge. 
Um, but how many of you know the greatest thing we could have spoken over our lives is that we were faithful and we were faithful to the end. When the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant, not woke servant, not contemporary servant, not not the servant that uh, yeah, was able to- Relevant yeah. servant. Yeah, relative servant that was able to, to down you know downplay the gospel or water down the gospel. That's, that's not what gets rewarded. Uh, there is a value for uh, faithfulness. God values faithfulness, and we should value faithfulness, even if the culture around us could care less about being faithful and true. Um, be bound by godly, righteous convictions and follow your conscience as it's informed by the Word and by the Spirit. Uh, and that's always solid ground. No matter no matter how much the, the sands of time are shifting, Stand and build your life on uh, a God-informed conscience and on biblical convictions, and you're going to make it in the end. So our last endorsement there. We're excited about what's coming. You know, uh, by the time you're hearing this podcast, we will have had a great time with uh, a special guest speaker here at Living Stones coming on Wednesday night, Trevor Loudon, who has written extensively on the Marxist undercurrents in America. We hope to have some good video for you uh, in future podcasts where we'll get into interviewing him and talking about some of these very, very important issues that are taking place uh, in America today. So until we meet again, we encourage you to spread this podcast far and wide. You probably have friends that could benefit from this. Uh, and uh, we hope it has been a great blessing to you. So until we meet again, have a great week. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time.